Hello and welcome to UK Column News. It's uh, Friday the 24th of April 2015, just after one o'clock. Um, I'm your host, Mike Robinson, with me, John Shackleton. And uh, via Skype, uh, we have uh, David Scott, as usual, um, for a Friday. So um, welcome, David. Can you hear us, David? Hello, gents. Hello. <laughs> right. OK, we're going to start uh, with the Cabbage Patch uh, Cretan again. Um, and here he is. He, today he is meeting uh, his partners in crime, in fact, uh, Merkel and Hollande, at least, uh, and discussing the tragedy in the Mediterranean, uh, a tragedy, uh, let's remember, of their making. Um, all of them uh, could be argued, should be in prison, uh, but perhaps with Obama as, as well. Um, and perhaps it should be the worst US prison that it's possible to find. But anyway, um, let's not forget that this man is such a hypocrite because he was also tweeting out this today. Um, and, uh, well, he destroys Britain's defence capability and still has the arrogance to suggest that we should be thankful about it. So here we are with the biggest defence budget in the EU. The UK will offer HMS Bulwark, three helicopters and two border patrol ships to help the rescue efforts. Too little, too late, I think. Um, and so uh, we're sending the Navy flagship there, HMS Bulwark. Uh, looks like we're sending our entire helicopter fleet um, and two border patrol ships. Uh, and that's two out of the four that we have, which of course were made in the Netherlands and not in Britain. Um, so uh, do you think the view that Cameron is uh, a liar and a hypocrite well, is extremist? Is that an extremist? Am I a non? He's, he's an extremist. I mean, this is not the first time that he's committed, as far as I'm concerned, genocide. And now he's, he's, he's kind of backpedaling, isn't he, and, and sending some of our uh, military, well, not even military, is it? You know, it's, uh, it's our UK borders patrol across there to help. I mean, the, the man has no shame. No shame Absolutely at all. Absolutely not. Any comments, David? Well, it would appear that um, love bombing other countries might not work. So we've, we've created... We've clearly had a huge hand, the, 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 the political elite of this country and across Europe, had a huge hand in creating the situation in uh, North Africa and in Libya in particular. We then went in um, to, to play around with the government and intervene in a civil war. And then we did what? Uh, not very much. Yeah. And there's, there's a crisis, and the crisis has got... Uh, French, British, American uh, government involvement all over it. And um, I think the very least that, that they should be doing is trying to save some lives here. It's, it's, very, it's very worrying, a very, very poor response. The interesting thing as well is Parliament's been dissolved, yet we've got David Cameron a meeting, well it's, well, it's not a secret meeting anymore, but he's meeting uh, the heads of other countries, but he's got actually... Has he got any power? No, well, he is permitted to do this so long as he doesn't uh, uh, do anything which could uh, tie the uh, the next government into any kind of... So he can't make any kind of treaty agreements or, or he can't make any kind of decisions. Yeah, exactly. So, um, so he can only go and uh, and gloat with them or something. I don't know what he's service. there for. Uh, but uh, he can obviously uh, deploy uh, humanitarian support because everybody would support that in general. But as I say, since he caused the problem... In the first place, it's slightly hypocritical, and it's certainly too little. Um, anyway, let's move on. Um, I wanted to um, highlight this article. Now, it is from, uh, uh, sorry, from 2014, uh, from March 2014. Um, it was sent through to me again, and I'd forgotten about it. And I just wanted to highlight this because it sort of reminds us how long this issue of um, the investigation into child sexual abuse and the and the institutional and establishment aspects of this have has been going on, uh, with no apparent move forward at all. So this is an article from the Mirror in March 2014, talking about the huge sums of taxpayers' cash that were handed to the paedophile information exchange between 1977 and 1980 under both the Labour government and Margaret Thatcher's first government, uh, and it was seventy thousand pounds that was handed over. Uh, and this, uh, in today's money, if you take inflation into account, would be equivalent to £400,000 plus. Um, and of course, at the time, the Paedophile Information Exchange um, was pushing for the age of consent to be lowered to four. Um, and uh, this article went on to uh, remind people of the uh, links that, of Harriet Harman uh, and Jack Dromey and uh, Patricia Hewitt had to the National Council for Civil Liberties um, at the time, uh, it was affiliated to PI, 
Um, and uh, so, you know, it just is staggering how a year, a year after this article, I mean, this article on its own should have been enough to do something significant, but we're, we're still no further. It's uh, a government funding, funding paedophiles rather than bringing justice, isn't it, really? Well, well that, was certainly, taxpayers money. that was certainly the case at the time, uh, but in the meantime, nothing has been done about it. No. Um, and of course, uh, if we bring ourselves right up to date, the, the Janner affair continues. Uh, and uh, the Times here is saying that pressure is growing, and indeed pressure does seem to be growing, on the law chief uh, to make Janner sta stand trial. We've got letters uh, from uh, the uh, from politicians urging a prosecution. Um, we've obviously uh, we've got the top blog here mentioning what we mentioned yesterday, uh, the issue of why there was no power of attorney with his uh, with his. Uh, a uh, flat swap for his children. Uh, and we have uh, from David here uh, sent me this uh, a quote, a tweet, sorry, from somebody saying, if Janner is suffering from acute dementia, how come he's still a, uh, how come he's a patron of Friends of Israel Education Foundation? And David, this, this, this just goes on and there doesn't seem to be, the, the establishment seems to be just digging its heels in with regard to Janner. Yes, th th there seems to be a, a clear pattern that there is no evidence other than in the, the, the sphere of the child abuse allegations that Jana has actually changed his lifestyle due to any ill health. The, the, the two million pound home transfer, um, the um, correspondence with the Lords, all of this is going on as, as though he were well. So that certainly brings in a big, uh, a big question mark over the decision that's been made here. But an even bigger one is over the, the, the DPP and their decision to to take this route, almost irrespective of of the health of of Jana, the the ha there has been in the UK in England um, uh, several cases where people have been prosecuted in their absence when they're not fit to stand stand trial, sure. but because of the nature of the crimes, it was considered to be in the public interest to go forward. So there's clearly an opportunity here that that's been missed. Um, a, a decision that could have been taken by Alison Saunders and she, she hasn't taken and I think she's got very serious questions. Well, because of well, public interest. In, in, indeed, and she, well, yes, indeed. And she, uh, she just seems to be, well, she's either digging her he heels in in some kind of arrogant, you can't, I'm untouchable kind of way or she's really uh, fighting her way into a corner here because uh, she's absolutely determined that she's right uh, according to the BBC here. But as well as that, she's basically saying, uh, you know, if you don't like my decision here, challenge me in court, and uh, that that in itself is is sure, well, it, seem, it seems it? it seems like complete arrogance to me. It is complete arrogance. What's I your mean, view, this David? Is a, it, this is a public interest matter. Oh. I mean, of course, it's a public interest matter, as as David has said, and the, the public need to know who's abusing children. That's it's as simple as that, isn't it? Yeah. You know, we want to know, don't we, David? Yes, I mean, arrogance is something that keeps coming up. Why are, why are the people in authority making uh, the decisions they are? They seem to be devoid of reason. They seem to be certainly devoid of any humility or any appreciation that, uh, that, that they put on their trousers one leg at, the, at a time the same as everybody else. And we'll see this later when we come to some statements by Lord Gill that there is a, a view that these people, uh, by virtue of their function, have rights uh, that exceed those of the normal citizen. They have um, a privileged function. Although we are, we're in a society where we don't have privileged persons, we do have privileged functions. And what you're seeing here is, is a privileged function and a, and a person responding to that, behaving in a privileged manner. That's right, you're quite correct, yeah. Indeed, and, <clears throat> uh, and the male here uh, pointing out that here is another example of uh, the police um, being blocked in their investigations, at least that's the allegation. Um, and of course, there are many, many other cases that we're aware of um, where, where similar allegations have been made by police that are involved in investigating child sexual abuse uh, and, and worse offences uh, and finding themselves hitting a brick wall at some point as soon as their case file goes to a certain level within the police force. Um, so, uh, of course, the, the, you know, this article saying that the, the block for the police happened 20 years ago. So theoretically, um, Janner actually would have been dealt with 20 years ago if, if, if they had been permitted to do their jobs. Uh, and, uh, and that hasn't happened. 
Um, so, uh, you know, what do we do about this, David? Well, the, the, the 20 years ago point um, was actually, I believe, in Glasgow. There certainly was one of the allegations which seemed to be extremely uh, well-founded was regarding uh, the, the rape of a, of a boy in, in a Glasgow hotel. And that was um, covered up in very dubious circumstances. And I would very much like to see the officials getting to the bottom of what happened there. Uh, we have a situation, obviously, where the a lot of the covering up in the Met was done under the watch of Sir Stephen House uh, and under the, the, the direct um, control of Sir Stephen House, it would seem. And Sir Stephen House is now head of Police Scotland. Now, I've raised this issue with the Scottish National Child Abuse Inquiry team who are putting together the inquiry just now. And I've asked the question, essentially, who guards the guards? Uh, raised the issue and sent them recordings of police officers uh, from the Met going on radio stations and recounting how they were about to make arrests, or in some cases had made arrests, and then the whole thing was stopped from on high. And on high included um, House, who was in overall control. Now, what, what role he had, I, I don't precisely know, but surely there are questions to, to answer there. So I raised this with the inquiry and uh, it was just batted back and said, if you've got any complaints, talk to the police complaints authority. They, they, they didn't want to know about actually addressing the issue of what's wrong with the police force, who within the police force can't be trusted and how we achieve justice without, without sorting that or rather how we sort that so that we can achieve justice. Um, an observation. Uh, which I'm going to ask you to comment on, is that the, these stories are continuing to trickle out in the mainstream press. And, and it appears to me, and I might be completely wrong, um, that they're, they are very carefully managing the release of these stories. They're keeping the public at a particular uh, temperature, shall we say, not allowing it to boil over. And they know that they've got I says, well, I believe that they know that they've got a lot more to release over the next, over the coming years, and it seems to me that that what they seem to be doing is is just just managing the release of these stories in the hope that uh, the the ire of the public will not boil over to a point where they actually have to take action against anybody. Do you, am I missing the point here, or is that is that something that you you kind of agree with? I I I do. I I suspect that if if the truth were known, and the truth were known rapidly, and in one big, uh, one big revelation, that it wouldn't just be a case of people being prosecuted. It would be a case of the, the, the people of the nation would refuse any longer to be ruled by these people, by these institutions, or by any combination thereof. That's the establishment, uh, isn't it? You know, you look at it, and I, I think, <clears throat> I don't want to get paranoid here, <laughs> David, uh, but I think the establishment is there and you've got these lords and, the, and these peers and the police and MPs, etc. And I think if one of them goes down, we could have a domino effect, couldn't we? Yes, I mean, certainly there's an element where it's the establishment will be protecting the establishment. And, and sometimes that's done explicitly. Uh, we've been asking questions in Scotland about the funding by the British taxpayer of a case taking a private civil action taken by the, the former Lord Advocate of Scotland, Dame Lisa Angelini, against Robert Greene. Yeah. This was taxpayers' money. And and we've been ask, asking questions like, how much taxpayers' money and what was it spent on? Now, the answer to those questions is, the formal answer in writing, is that we, yes, we can see there's a public interest, we have that information, we can see there's a public interest to release it, but there's an overriding public interest not to release it because to release that information would jeopardise the smooth running of government. In fact, would, would damage the smooth running of government. So they're basically stating that if we know the truth, they won't be able to govern us. And we have that in writing. So I think there's an element where it is, uh, they're, they're all hanging together so that they don't hang separately. Yeah, yeah. Um, right, well, just before we move on, um, I just want to highlight something that, from the chat box here, because Martin uh, Edwards pointing out that... Uh, Alison Saunders, of course, is common purpose. Now, if, right, if, you, yeah. if you want to understand the implications of that, please get on to um, the UK Column website and read his article, The Rotherham Common Purpose Effect. Um, I haven't yet published on the website the article 
uh, the, the similar article from the last newspaper um, uh, that uh, that follows up on that. So um, I'll maybe I'll, I'll do that this afternoon if I can. I think because it seems like a good time. But do have a look at the Rotherham Common Purpose Effect if you want to understand the the implications of uh, Alison Saunders being a Common Purpose graduate. Um, right, uh, Anzac Day plots what? Well, this one's quite interesting. You mentioned it this morning. I looked more into detail of this. <clears throat> it's quite interesting that some things are, the police want to get involved in and other matters they don't want to get involved in. This is a very interesting situation where we find a 14-year-old boy uh, from Blackburn uh, as being arrested under Section 59 of the Terrorism Act 2000. Uh, the deputy head, Deborah Walsh, from the CPS again, Crown Prosecution Services, said the prosecution is in the public interest. Now, child abuse isn't, but it seems a 14-year-old uh, messing about through digital means, whether it's through Xbox or PlayStation, has basically said he should chop his head off. And because he's basically said this, and this is fact, uh, he's been arrested, and Detective Chief Superintendent Tony Mole has said he's incited another person to commit an act of terrorism on Anzac Day Parade in Australia. Uh, on the same day, 15... Sorry, on the same day, five other teenagers were, were held in raids and uh, are, are being questioned in Melbourne at the moment. But what my take on this is, you know, I've got children and I have to tell them off from time to time. In fact, they're adults now, so I, they keep telling me that they're young adults, so I better not call them children. Uh, and they, do, they did used to spend time on PS3s and Xboxes, etc. And, you know, they play war games and da 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 and One day I had a chat with them and I said, look, this, you're wasting your life. You know, you're absolutely wasting your life on Facebook, PS3, et cetera, et cetera. And they all talk about we're killing the zombies or we're doing this and we're doing that. This seems to be something very similar where some kids have been going, oh, you should chop his head off. You know, I know a few MPs that should have their heads chopped off. But does that mean that I should be arrested under, sec under Section 59 of the Terrorism Act? I mean, this seems to be bonkers when we talk about law well, general and things like this. It has to be said that I think, you know, when I was that age, CB radio was the thing. That's right. If, yeah. I, if anybody had recorded the kind of nonsense that was being talked uh, among 14 and 15 year olds on CB in those days, That's you know. Right. <laughs> Have you got any thoughts on this, David? The, yeah, the, the, the general tendency to, to not use sound judgment is something that keeps coming up. The, the public interest test uh, only really means anything if someone's using your know, well well founded and sound judgment, and that means to have a, a philosophic viewpoint and a world view on which you can base sound judgment. Now, there's there's an idea here that 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 ideas have consequences. If you have a world view that um, ISIS terrorism, um, uh, you know, dark skin terrorists pre preaching a heretical religion. Is, is what's going to bring the country down, then you maybe see these problems everywhere. But if, if you're much more interested in are we able to live uh, peaceful, lawful lives with our children safe from abuse by those in power, then you maybe see the world completely differently. Indeed. Exactly, yeah, exactly. So. Indeed, okay, so <clears throat> let's move on. Uh, this is the Magna Carta Trust, and they have decided, it seems, that to commemorate the 800 years of democracy, they say, um, that they are going to uh, um, provide every primary school in the country a copy of the Magna Carta and some other stuff. Now, just before uh, John tells us what it is exactly they're going to provide, um, the Magna Carta Trust, by the way, uh, contains, or at least has, some such upstanding people as trustees, as the Lord Mayor of the City of London and the Remembrancer of the City of London. So it is absolutely... Uh, establishment, <laughs> yes, um, and uh, and this seems to be part of what they intend to distribute, the Magna Carta Chronicle. What what kind of content are we going to see in this? Well, <clears throat> again, I know people keep saying it's an agenda, but this is quite clear an agenda. I'd love uh, children, I'd love my children to have been taught the Magna Carta as I was, and I, I, I do love our, our rich history that we have in the United Kingdom. Uh, I just wish some other people in government would. But this is for key stage two and key stage three children, and it's to teach them partly how laws are shaped and enforced. I don't like that word, enforced. That's, that's not really the sentiment of the Magna Carta. It's not. The sentiment of the Magna Carta is all about freedom, you know. 
Uh, but they're talking about enforce, so how laws are created so that the government can enforce yeah. something that, upon yourself. And the power of, or a right to act, speak or think as one wants, or the state of not being imprisoned or enslaved. Now, at this moment in time, uh, I believe this country is enslaved. But they were also talking about citizenship, weren't they? They were. Citizenship and what it means to be a good citizen. And, and it, it looked like it's really promoting the... Compliance. The, well, it's the, <laughs> the constitutional reformist notion that, uh, that the individual has a duty to the state rather than That's the right. state having a duty exactly, yeah. to yeah. the individual. So, um, so it looks like uh, we're going to see, um, well, propaganda being pumped directly End of into... this month into the schools, into, yeah, the, into, the, into the education the heads system. Of our, our children. Brilliant. Uh, what do you think, David? Well, I was at a, a meeting last night which was against the named person provision where you have a state-appointed guardian for every child in Scotland. And uh, one of the people in the audience uh, during the Q&A was quoting the Magna Carta and pointing out that this assault on our liberty um, drove a coach and horses through it. Um, so there is uh, at least some regard for it uh, north of the border. We're seeing some people um, looking back to these, these older, older parts of the Constitution to find um, a means of resisting uh, the, on, the ongoing infringement of our liberties. Yeah, exactly. And this is where people now in groups are coming together and they're basically saying, do you know what, I'm not having this. Yeah. I want my children to inherit what, what is right to inherit, which is our freedoms, you know, our national freedom, uh, our liberties, the freedom to protest if we want to protest, you know. I mean, it, it seems now if you, if you play Xbox or you're on Twitter and you say you should chop his head off, then uh, the anti-terrorism police come round and lock you up. But, but if you rape a child, i.e. in a hotel room or in Westminster, then it's okay. It's okay. Which Allegedly. it quite clearly isn't okay. Right. Um, well, speaking of uh, gatherings, um, let's remind ourselves that this time next week, uh, well, in fact, we will be in uh, Nottingham at this event on the 1st of May. This is the day that uh, Tom Crawford is back in court over his property uh, and uh, lots of people expected. If you can get along to that, please do get along to that. Um, and, uh, and actually on the 2nd of May, I'm told, uh, the, uh, there'll be a, a, another sort of pre-release showing of, uh, I think this will be the last pre-release showing of the Great British Mortgage Swindle. Uh, that's going to take place in the Savoy Cinema in Nottingham. So if you're still up there on the 2nd, uh, that's at midday. Uh, do get along to that. Can I just highlight uh, the, the, this video once again? Uh, please, uh, later on, stop the, the, the rerun of this uh, programme and, uh, and go and watch this film if you haven't seen it. Uh, if you, and if you have seen it, please promote it as hard as you can. Uh, let's not forget that tomorrow is the 60th anniversary conference for the National Health Foundation. Scott Tips and his team do a great job, so we're happy to support that. And, uh, and also um, uh, AV6. So let's just watch uh, Ian's short uh, promotional. So I've been watching and watching and watching, and 9-11 was just an incredible mind control event you know it, it was apparent to me then as it is today that people are literally mind controlled that they're not actually thinking for themselves most of us are simply regurgitating we live in a bubble and a lot of times until you remove yourself from that bubble you can't really you don't even know you're living in a bubble in a kind of an information prison in the west but these guys have got a lot of money and we complain about mcdonald's and all that sort of thing do you know why they've got so much money because we fucking buy their shit. So it's time to stop it. Stay, you know, people say to me, where do we go? What's the first step? Stop supporting the companies that don't give a shit. Be who you are. Don't police your thoughts and don't police your expression. Express yourself, you know. But work for something positive. Express yourself in a positive way, you know. Create a better world because you're in it. Now, what is your legacy that you leave behind? Is the world better because you are here? Or is it worse because you're here? Or just, did you just not participate? You know, because you have to participate. You really do.
Okay, so do uh, support those events if you possibly can. Um, now, David, onto your sort of uh, your main uh, stories uh, today. Um, we're starting off here uh, with uh, Judge Brian Gill uh, attacking judicial reforms. Uh, and this was in a speech he gave to the uh, Commonwealth Law Conference in Glasgow uh, last weekend. So what, what happened there? Well, the, yes. So Lord, Lord Gill is the head of the Scottish judiciary. So he's, he's the top judge, numero uno. Um, he, he gave a very intemperate speech, um, which was ostensibly about judicial independence, uh, which we would all support. But it got, from what I'm hearing, a bit of a stunned silence and, and gasp. Did, it, did he really say that type response from the crowd? Um, one of the quotes here uh, is worth just, just pondering for a moment. He said, quote, uh, the threat to judicial independence does, uh, or the threats to judicial independence do not always come with a knock on the door in the middle of the night. In a society that prides itself on the independence of its judiciary, the threat may come in insidious ways, even at the hands of well-meaning governments and legislators, in the name of efficiency and ironically in the name of transparency. So there you have it, calling for transparency. Uh, asking the, the judges um, to reveal their own personal interests, conflicts of interests, and to do things in a manner which is open to the inspection by the public. That's an insidious assault on judicial independence. And I suppose in one way he is right, that there are many things that judges do that if we knew about them, they couldn't do. Yeah. But that's not the sort of independence we want. That sort of independence is called tyranny. What we want is people who are able to operate in the open, in the daylight, so that their deeds can be seen by the entire community and they're, they're protected by the rightness of their decision, not by the secrecy in which it is done. There, there used to be, um, in fact, there's a biblical law against any capital crime being tried at night. One of the interesting uh, sort of side issues of um, the account of the trial of Jesus Christ is it was the entire thing was in fact illegal because it was a capital crime and he was arrested and tried at night. This wasn't allowed under current, under Jewish law at the time. Such matters had to be tried in daylight. There's a reason for that. We need some daylight, we need some sunlight into the Scottish judicial system. And um, Lord Gill doesn't seem to agree. But he goes on, there's one more quote you need to get a hold of here. He says, two years ago, I was crossing the square outside my court. Notice whose court it is, my court. When I noticed two individuals standing, perhaps appropriately, at the heart of Midlothian, the scene of public executions in Edinburgh in former times, they were holding a large banner. It caught my eye. It said, Lord Gill, resign. I never discovered what the reasons were, but I thought what a privilege it was to be a judge in a society where the public could make a constructive suggestion of that nature without being taken away by the police. Now, I think that statement was viewed and delivered in a way that, that people viewed as being um, I ironic and maybe suggested that really he actually did want the people to be taken away by the police. Um, and referring to the ability to publicly protest uh, as, a, as a privilege is also quite concerning. So there was a lot about that speech that, that bothered us and um, um, the Scottish legal blogger Peter Kirby, um, as always, was, uh, was, was quick to get the message out and, and he's doing a lot. And, and other people observing these these things are doing a lot to improve the transparency of the Scottish judiciary. But the judges themselves, I'm afraid, are, are not always taking the action. Certainly Lord Gill is not taking the action that needs to be taken. Is there any hope for the Scottish judiciary, actually? Well, there's positive signs as well, because the, there are horror stories, but there are also members of the judiciary standing up and and, and speaking out on such things as corroboration, which which has been confirmed, the, the moves in Parliament by the SNP government to end the requirement for corroboration have been abandoned. And they've been abandoned in, in no small part 
because of some very principled and, and, and well-argued opposition from elements of the judiciary themselves. So there are certainly people of the, of, of the finest um, character and ability in there. It's just there seems to be people who are I, I maybe also afflicted with a sort of a sort of privilege and privileged position and privileged attitudes that we talked about before, yeah. and who don't recognise that that they have a job to do, but they are, it, the the requirement for for it to be done openly and and lawfully must override everything else. The problem is they're like a, they're like their own little clan, aren't they? You know, they have their little you know some are in do it do it. Dare I say the Freemasons, and and they'll get whispers in their ears over certain issues, and they get the, manipulated the, so easily. It's like like MPs are being manipulated by the corporate out there. I, I don't know what you think, David. Sorry to interrupt you there. No, no. There's a lot of concern over Freemasonry, and I think one of the one of the areas where it may be that the calls for um, a register of judicial interests for such things as share holdings and things yeah, like this, yeah, exactly. financial interest, be, yeah. is being resisted. As I suspect that if we get that, the next move will be to, to reveal membership of secret societies. But but that should have that should be done in a transparent manner as well. Yeah. Because how can anybody um go before a judge where that judge may have a secret oath to some other group it's and you don't crazy, know about it? it? That's a completely unacceptable situation. Yeah, yeah totally. Um, you uh, you mentioned being at a meeting with regard to the name person. Uh, do you want to say any more about this story, or is that have you covered it already? Uh, no, I think there's one or two more comments just just to cover this. Um, the it's important to note that the Scottish Conservative Party, who were a, a little bit fence sitting on the name person, they, they abstained in the original vote. They didn't vote for it, but they didn't actually vote against it. It was part of a much larger bill, and. Um, so they abstained, and certain people within the Scottish Conservatives have been very outspoken in opposing this. But now the, the entire party, uh, led by Ruth Davidson, has come out strongly against the name person scheme and demanded that um, Nicola Sturgeon abandon it and, and, and repeal the legislation. Now, so far, Nicola is uh, refusing to do this, but it's certainly a move forward for the campaign against the name person scheme that there's now a major political party in fact too because UKIP are also a against it but it's certainly in Scottish terms in in, in votes and seats uh, a major political party has has come out and openly backed repeal of this legislation so I think that's a milestone um, the article you, you you put up in the screen brief briefly there was from Scotsman who reported it. The BBC managed to report it without ever mentioning the name person scheme, so there seems to be a bit of an agenda in their reporting. How did they manage that? Uh, oh, it was a skillful moment. They, 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 they <laughs> talked about corroboration, and then they said, they said that Ruth Davidson um, uh, uh, raised, in, it was in First Minister's questions, uh, a lot of matters relating to areas covered by the Scottish Parliament, and she did so very vigorously. And then they moved on, and they never said what these vigorously raised topics were. They just skirted over it. Okay, well... Um, but the, the, the Scotsman article made one mistake. They said this, the scheme was there to provide uh, a state guardian to oversee the welfare of children. It's not welfare, it's well-being, and you have to remember that's a different a, word. A very yeah, different word, diff yeah. Well-being yeah. means everything. Everything in the child's life, that's yeah. what's been overseen by the Scottish government, not just welfare. Okay, um, also in the Scotsman then, this article, SN, SNP Justice Shambles Alarm for Scots Democracy. Tell us about this. Yes, this, this is, this is a, a, a Lord, uh, Lord McCloskey who's stating, um, he, he's been opposing the um, removal of corroboration and He's been successful, that campaign has been successful, and the plan to drop corroboration from Scots law, and it's absolutely key to Scots law in the protection from the individual and protection against wrongful conviction. Um, that, that campaign's been successful, and that part of, of the current justice bill has been dropped by the SNP administration. So just to remind ourselves, this was you were talking about this last week or the week before, where they were intending to drop the, the requirement for uh, any kind of corroborative evidence in, in yes. court cases? Yes. So, so if you get, essentially you could be convicted on essentially hearsay evidence where uh, a bare 
a majority of a jury uh, believes it and thinks you're guilty, but you could still have seven out of 15 people thinking you're innocent on uncorroborated um, um, you know, hearsay or, or similar testimony, and you could you could go to jail. It, it was a, a very worrying development. It was opposed by a great number of the legal profession and and the judiciary, and that that opposition has been successful. But here, um, Lord McCoskey uh, raises a wider point, which is how did we get there in the first place? The issue is the way the SNP run the party. They have um, essentially they require all their MSPs and their MPs to take what amounts to an oath not to publicly disagree with the party line at all, ever, under any circumstances. And this, you won't be surprised to hear, tends to stifle debate. So you had a situation where this plan for ending corroboration was pushed through, even though many people within the SNP, many of the MSPs, uh, had huge reservations about it, but those reservations couldn't be aired in public. So we didn't have the sort of debate that we needed. We didn't have the problems highlighted and sorted out. And we had to go through the the, the spectacle of Mr McCaskill ramming this through Parliament using um, the, the SNP majority and 100% and compliance of, of all SNP members. And then um, months later, after the opposition within Scotland has managed to get itself organised, it all, all has to be unpicked and then, and then abandoned. How, how does that work, David? Does Nicola Sturgeon, as First Minister, not have to take some kind of oath of office? So, in she other does, words... Yeah, uh, there, is a, there is an oath of office, you're right. Um, and when I said oath, it's probably not technically an oath, but it is an undertaking not to disagree with the party line. They basically promise not, there's no disagreement. There is one party line and that's it. So essentially what Nicola Sturgeon and the other people in, uh, it's not smoke-filled rooms anymore, this is, this is Scotland, you're not allowed to have smoke-filled rooms, non-smoke-filled rooms, um, decide. That information is then passed down to the party faithful and the party machine. And that's it, there is no more debate. It's a um, little bit religious, like in terms of the leadership make the decisions and the rest um, follow the decisions. Okay. Uh, okay. And the next article you wanted to cover was from The Courier, uh, that the Church of Scotland is losing 300 members a week. What, what, was, your, what was your interest in this? Well, this is, this is again, an, an item of, along the, along the lines that ideas have consequences. Um, Scotland was built on certain ideas. Uh, the, those ideas were widely shared across the vast majority of the population. They were based on Christianity, they were based on adherence to the Ten Commandments, the rule of law, they were brought up with the Psalms, it was a very traditional view of the world, and it was inherently law-abiding. And it was, um, it had within it certain truths that are essential for um, a, a, a peaceful and loving society. Uh, those um, those ideas are no longer really being promulgated by the Church of Scotland. They're 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 embracing things which uh, the Church of Scotland of old would have would have looked on looked on with um, complete horror. Um, uh, you know, homosexual clergy, uh, same sex marriages has been has been one touchstone of this, but also. Um, the more general view that what they're into, that what they're in place to do, is to promote some sort of social doctrine, um, not Christianity, but but a a, a, a social, collectivist, communitarian, um, political philosophy. A common purpose, perhaps. Well, you could you could say that, yes. Um, and what's happening as a result? is that the membership is just ebbing away as, as, as people die off, they're not being replaced because they're not holding up anything that's particularly unique or, or distinct. Uh, it's really just a kind of watered down version of the common themes of our society. They're certainly not trying to improve or change society. And that strand of, of thinking in Scotland is in, is in very sad and severe decline. And my concern is that will have wider consequences for society as a whole and for the nation as a whole. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Well, let's let's move along to uh, the Deutsche Bank um, because uh, it, 
Bloomberg here reporting uh, with their new brightly coloured website uh, that the Deutsche Bank is going to have to pay a record two and a half billion dollars to resolve LIBOR. Um, so record two and a half billion dollars fine uh, or bribe or payoff, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and they also have to fire seven employees. Uh, six of those are London based and one is from Frankfurt. Uh, and apparently they, uh, they engaged in wrongful conduct. They didn't break the law, apparently. They engaged in wrongful conduct, according to the New York Department of Financial Services. And that was a statement they made yesterday. Uh, and, uh, well, so this lets the Deutsche Bank off um, without any criminal prosecutions, as far as I can see, um, in both the United States and the UK. Um, pretty Typical of banks, isn't typical it? Typical situation. Age, you know, they, can, they can money launder or they can do anything what they want. They can even say what they want and, uh, I, indeed, and but, bribe people. But it looks, like, uh, it looks like HSBC might be leaving and I think that's a real shame. It is. I mean, partly, you know, the, the history of HSBC is quite interesting. Uh, I mean, they came to the UK when they bought the Midland Bank, didn't they, back in 1992. Uh, they've been doing a... They've been doing some interesting practices. That's all I'm going to say. Well, since the they years. were since they were established, they they have been laundering drug money, uh, pretty much since they've been established. So is that really whether, true? Yeah, it is really true. So yeah. whether that's whether that's uh, uh, opium money from China or cocaine money from uh, from Mexico or whatever. Well, they've uh, got a, a shareholders meeting that started at eleven o'clock this morning. So right. it'd be interesting to see what goes on there. Bear in mind that they also employ two hundred sixty-six thousand people worldwide. So this is no small organisation. I don't know what David feels about this uh, this meeting of minds. Well, I I went uh, one time. I didn't actually open a bank account in HSBC, but I did go to inquire, and I said I was uh, very interested in opening a bank account with them because they were the bank that had been founded by Scottish drug dealers. Uh, which I pointed out were obviously the best sort of drug dealers. <laughs> and and they, they, they smiled and nodded and said, yes, we, we were founded by Scottish drug dealers. So the staff know uh, the history of the bank. It was Matheson and Jardin, and it was money from the Opium Wars that, that, that set this up originally. So an, another uh, fabulous international Scottish organisation, uh, world-beating clearly. Uh, will we be sorry if they go? I, I think we'll get over it. Yeah, we will. Yeah, uh, so, so I mean, Scotland has a bit of a reputation uh, because they also it was also a Scottish man. I don't know if he was a drug dealer, but certainly a Scottish man who set up the Bank of England. And we've done very that, well. That, that was that a regime. Scottish crook. That that was a Scottish crook that set up the Bank of England. And there was also another Scottish Scottish con man. Uh, was it? I think called Law, who went and set up um, a bank in uh, France, and he inflated the South Sea bubble. So he caused one of ah. the major. Um, uh, international booms and busts of all time. So, when you know, from a Scottish perspective, we hear people talking about the international Jewish banking conspiracy, and we feel very hard done by because credit. <laughs> <is true. laughs> um, we we can we can hold our heads high in international banking conspiracy terms and compare ourselves to anybody. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much, David. Thank you Excellent. very much. Uh, yeah. We'll we'll leave it at that point. Thanks to all our viewers. Uh, thank you, John, uh, and we'll see you on Monday at the usual time. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.